Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Brian Lynn reports on an airplane flown with sustainable fuel. John Russell has a story on the connection between a Rubik's cube. And the violin. Jill Robbins reports on calls to remove trans fat by the WHO. Later, we present the next part in our American History series. But first, International Airline Emirates says it successfully flew a Boeing 777 on a test flight with one engine running on a mixture. Of sustainable fuel, the test flight took place Monday and lasted about an hour. The Emirates plane took off from Dubai International Airport and then headed out into the Persian Gulf before returning to the airport. The Boeing 777 aircraft. Was powered by two General Electric engines. One engine ran on the sustainable mixture. The other was powered by traditional airplane fuel to ensure safety. Emirates Chief Operating Officer Adel Alrada called the successful test flight a milestone moment. For Emirates and a positive step for our industry, he said the step demonstrated the airline's desire to deal with one of the industry's biggest problems: carbon pollution releases related to air travel. Emirates is a state-owned airline operated by the United Arab Emirates, or UAE. The UAE is a collection of seven emirates, also known individually as sheikdoms. The ruler of one of the emirates, Dubai, is Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. He described the sustainable fuel used for the flight as a mix that mirrored the qualities of jet fuel. The mixture included fuel provided by Neste, a Finnish company, and U.S.-based fuel maker Virant. Virant says it uses plant-based sugars to make the compounds needed for sustainable jet fuel. Neste's fuel is made from vegetable oils and animal fats. Those fuels cut the release of heat-trapping carbon dioxide, burned off by engines in flight. Airline flights release only one sixth the amount of carbon dioxide produced by cars and trucks. The Washington-based World Resources Institute reports. However, airplanes are used by far fewer people per day than road vehicles. This means flying has a higher per capita release of carbon emissions. Airplane and engine manufacturers have been designing more environmentally friendly versions in recent years. The general goal is to produce less polluting engines to reduce fuel emissions in an effort to help limit the effects of climate change. But the measures have also helped cut operating costs related to fuel. Emirates, for example, used more than five metric tons of jet fuel last year alone. This amounted to about 3.7 billion dollars of Emirates' 17 billion dollars in yearly operating costs.
Experts have noted that fuels considered sustainable can be three times or more the cost of traditional jet fuel. This added cost is likely to be passed on to flyers if sustainable fuels became more commonly used across the industry. I'm Brian Lynn. A University of Michigan student is one of the world's top speed cubers, a person able to quickly solve a Rubik's cube. He is also a talented violinist. Stanley Chapel says the two activities work well together. He adds that he has equal interest in both. But the twenty-one-year-old says the violin has helped him succeed in speed cubing. Chapel is studying violin performance at the university's School of Music, Theater, and Dance. He said that ideas he learned from music study, such as repetition, and breaking things down into their smallest elements, helped him get better at cubing. Chapel grew up in Ann Arbor, not far from where the University of Michigan is located. He solved his first three-by-three three Rubik's Cube as a fourteen-year-old. Five weeks later, Chapel entered his first competition, solving the cube in an average of twenty-two seconds. In 2017 in Paris, Chapel placed fifth in both the 4x4 four four blindfolded and 5x5 five five blindfolded groups at the World Cube Association World Championship. At the 2019 World Championship in Melbourne, Australia, he won both events. Accounting for the time it takes for him to study the cube before placing the blindfold over his eyes, Chapel can solve one in around seventeen seconds. The deeper I go into cubing technique, the more I find interest in pushing the boundaries of what's possible there, he said. Chapel has some strong natural abilities. He is able to remember thousands of ways to solve a Rubik's Cube and perform one of Johann Sebastian Bach's violin pieces from memory. But Chapel also spends many hours working on his skills. In addition, he does regular hand exercises that help him avoid the kinds of pains that come with the large amounts of time turning the cube's sides. Chapel says years of playing the violin also has helped him have very, very fine motor control already built up. Later this year, Chapel plans to defend his world titles in South Korea. Once he is done with school, though, Chapel is not sure how speed cubing fits into his future plans. I guess it's cool to know that nobody is able to do this, he said. But at the same time, giving myself a little bit of a reality check, it's like, how much does that actually matter? It's not going to pay the bills when I'm older. Chapel said, laughing. I'm John Russell. Hey, Dr. Jill. Want to go get lunch today? I'd love to. Where do you usually like to go? There's a great food truck around the corner. It has Mexican food. Is it the one with the fried burritos? Yeah, they're fantastic. Aren't you worried about trans fats? I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, in my story today, we tell about how many people have died due to trans fats. So, the World Health Organization is trying to ban them. But I think the restaurants here in D.C. don't use that kind of oil for deep frying. Yes, now many of them use better oils, like olive oil, for cooking that way. Can you explain where trans fats come from? Yes, the World Health Organization says they come from an industrial process that adds hydrogen, a kind of gas, to vegetable oils. It's cheaper than good oils, and it makes food stay fresh longer. Sounds like I should watch out for it in things like donuts, cakes, cookies, and deep-fried foods. Too bad I really like those things. So let's go out and get a salad for lunch, okay? Sounds good to me. But first, let's listen to your story. The World Health Organization, or WHO, 
has called for a total ban on what it calls industrially produced trans fatty acids worldwide in 2023. The health organization said the artificially produced form of fat is responsible for half a million early deaths each year. Products containing trans fat are commonly found in baked goods and cooking oils. In 2020, the WHO said more than 58 countries have introduced laws to protect people from artificial trans fat. But, it said, more than 100 countries should remove them from their food supplies. The health agency reported that two-thirds of the deaths that it blames on trans fat happened in 15 countries. Of these countries, Canada, Latvia, Slovenia, and the United States have set limits on or banned artificial trans fat. But many countries have yet to take action. In Asia, the countries are Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, India, Iran, and South Korea. Others include Ecuador, Mexico, and Egypt. Tom Frieden is head of the public health organization Resolve to Save Lives. The organization is working with the WHO to remove artificial trans fat from the international food supply. He said the total removal of trans fat from food could prevent up to 17 million deaths from heart-related disease by 2040. The American Heart Association is a nonprofit group that supports heart health and research. It says there are two different kinds of trans fat. Natural trans fat forms in the gut of some animals and foods made from these animals, such as milk and meat products. Artificial trans fat, also called trans fatty acids, is created through an industrial process that adds hydrogen to vegetable oils. Food makers use this lower-cost oil so food will stay fresh longer. Trans fat can be found in foods such as donuts, cakes, cookies, and deep-fried foods. Baked goods that sit on store shelves for many months but remain soft and moist usually contain trans fat. This is because the oil remains solid at room temperature. Frieden from Resolve to Save Lives said it is important to understand the difference between artificial trans fat and saturated fat. He called trans fat a toxic chemical which should be completely removed from the food supply. That is different from saturated fat, a common substance in many food groups, which nobody is proposing to ban. Frieden said, Think of artificial trans fat as the tobacco of nutrition. It has no values. In 2018, the WHO launched a step-by-step -step guide calling on governments around the world to remove artificial trans fat from the food supply. The guide urges governments to replace trans fats with oils such as olive oil, creating public awareness of the harms of trans fat and enforcing the anti-trans fat policies and laws. By the end of 2020, the health agency said new laws have protected more than 3.2 billion people from the substance. Most of the action came from wealthy countries and areas. But several low- and lower-middle-income countries, including Bangladesh, India, the Philippines, and Ukraine, also followed WHO's best practices for artificial trans fat. India's policy covers more than 1 billion people and Nigeria is expected to join South Africa as the second African country to remove trans fats. I'm Jill Robbins. 
Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. Soon after the Civil War ended in 1865, thousands of Americans began to move west to settle the land. The great movement of settlers continued for almost 40 years. The great empty West, in time, became fully settled. The discovery of gold had already started a great movement to California. Robert Bostick and Leo Scully tell about the gold rush and the important part cowboys played in settling the West. Men had rushed to the gold fields with hopes of becoming rich. A few found gold; the others found only hard work and high prices. When their money was gone, they gave up the search for gold. But they stayed in California to become farmers, or businessmen, or laborers. Some never gave up the search for riches. They moved back toward the east, searching for gold and silver in the wild country between California and the Mississippi River. Each new gold rush brought more people from the east. Mining camps quickly grew into towns, with stores, hotels, even newspapers. Most of these towns, however, lived only as long as gold was easy to find. Then they began to die. In some of the gold centers, big mining companies. Bought up all the land from those who first claimed it. These companies brought in mining machines that could dig out the gold from deep underground and separate it from the rock that held it. These companies needed equipment and other supplies. Transportation companies were formed. They carried supplies to the mining camps. In huge wagon trains pulled by slow-moving oxen, roads were built, and in some places, railroads. The great wealth taken from the gold and silver mines was usually invested in other businesses: shipping, railroads, factories, stores, land companies. More jobs were created in the West, and living conditions got better. More and more people decided to leave the crowded East for a new life in the West. But the big Eastern cities continued to grow. New factories and industrial centers were built. People moved from the farms. To find work in the cities, the growth of these industrial centers created a big demand for food, especially meat. Chicago quickly became the heart of the meat industry. Railroads brought animals to Chicago, where packing companies killed them, and prepared the meat for eastern markets. Special railroad cars. Kept the meat cold, so it would remain fresh until sold. As the meat industry grew, the demand for fresh meat increased. More and more cattle were needed. There were millions of cattle in Texas, but no way to get them to the eastern markets. The closest point on the railroad. Was Sedalia, Missouri, more than one thousand kilometers away? Some cattlemen believed it might be possible to walk cattle to the railroad, letting them feed on the open grassland along the way. Early in 1866, 
a group of Texas cattlemen decided to try this. They put together a huge herd of more than 260,000 cattle and set out for Sedalia. There were many problems on that first cattle drive. The country was rough, grass and water, sometimes hard to find. Bandits and Indians followed the herd, trying to steal cattle. Farmers had put up fences in some areas, blocking the way. Most of the great herd was lost along the way, but the cattlemen believed they had proved that cattle could be walked long distances to the railroad. They believed a better way to the railroad could be found, with plenty of grass and water. The cattlemen got the Kansas Pacific Railroad to extend its line west to Abilene, Kansas. There was a good trail from Texas to Abilene. Cattlemen began moving their herds up this trail, across the Oklahoma Territory, and into Kansas. At Abilene, the cattle were put on trains and carried to Chicago. In the next four years, more than one and a half million cattle were moved north over the Chisholm Trail to Kansas. Other trails were found as the railroad moved farther west. Trail drives usually began with the spring roundup. Cattlemen would send out cowboys to search the open grasslands for their animals. As the cattle were brought in, the young animals were branded, marked, to show who owned them. Then they were released with their mothers to spend another year in the open country. The other cattle were put together for the long drive to Kansas. Usually they were moved in groups of 2,500 to 5,000 animals. Twelve to twenty cowboys took them up the trail. The cowboys worked hard on a trail drive. They had to keep the herd together day and night and protect it from bad men and Indians. They had to keep the cattle from moving too fast or running away. If they moved too fast, they would lose weight, and their owner would not get as much money for them. The cowboys would walk the cattle only 20 to 30 kilometers a day. The cattle could feed all night and part of the morning before starting each day. If the grass was good and the herd moved slowly, the cattle would get heavier and bring more money. In the early 1880s, the price of cattle rose to $50 each, and many cattlemen became rich. Business was so good that a $5,000 investment in the cattle industry could make $45,000 in four years. More and more people began raising cattle, and early cattlemen greatly increased the size of their herds. Within a few years, there was not enough grass for all the cattle, especially along the trails. There was so much meat that the price began to fall. There were two severe winters that killed hundreds of thousands of cattle. An extremely dry summer killed the grass, and thousands more died of hunger. The cattle industry itself almost died. Cattlemen also had problems with farmers and sheepmen. Farmers coming west would claim grassland used by the cattle growers. 
they would put up fences and plow up the land to plant crops. Other settlers brought huge herds of sheep to compete with cattle for the grass, and the sheep always won. Cattle would not eat grass where sheep had eaten. Violence broke out. Cattle growers fought the farmers and sheepmen for control of the land. The cattlemen finally had to settle land of their own, putting up fences and cutting the size of their herds. They no longer could let their cattle run free on public lands. By the late 1800s, the years of the cowboys were ending. But the story of the cowboy and his difficult life would not be forgotten. Even today, the cowboy lives in movies, on television, and in books. When one thinks of the Wild West of America, he does not think of the miners who opened the way to the West. Nor does he think of the men who struggled to build the first railroads across the wild land. And one does not think of the farmers who pushed slowly westward to fence, plow, and plant the land. The words Wild West bring to mind just one character, the cowboy. His difficult fight to protect his cattle on the long trail was an exciting story. It has been told by many writers. Perhaps the best known was a young Easterner, Owen Wister. He worked as a cattleman for several years, then wrote about the heroic life of the cowboy in a book called The Virginian. Another Easterner who came west to learn about the cowboy was the artist Frederick Remington. Remington was a cowboy for only two years, but he spent the rest of his life painting pictures of the West and writing about it. His exciting works made the West and the cowboy come to life for millions who never saw a real cowboy. The cowboy has also lived in music. He had his own kind of songs that told of his problems, his hopes, and his feelings. <laughs> 